Hello, everybody. I hope you're all doing okay. Uh, welcome to my presentation titled Conservation in a Dynamic Ocean. My name is Ignacio. I am a marine conservation biologist currently working as a scientific research officer for Mar Alliance in Panama. And well, thank you to all of you for being here and listening to me jab a bit about my work. And thank you to Joe from Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants for inviting all of us to share a bit about our story. So to give you a bit of background about my work, it focuses on top pelagic predators. So this is just a fancy way of saying that these are predators which feed and almost exclusively live in the open ocean. This includes animals like seabirds, sea turtles like the loggerhead and the leatherback, a large bony fish like marlins and tunas, or cartilaginous fish like sharks and sea rays. So they are all, they are all long lived and highly mobile with some individuals living longer than 80 years and traversing thousands of kilometers throughout their lives. And what they all do have is a vital role in the health of marine ecosystems. And because, as because they're top predators, they confer food web stability. And when you remove top predators from an ecosystem, you get some pretty catastrophic cascading effects all the way down to primary producers. So to talk a bit about bycatch, Sorry for the very graphic images on the right, but I think it's important that everybody is aware of the reality of what's going on out there. So bycatch can be defined as the incidental capture of non-target species. It is an issue occurring virtually in all fishing fleets across the world. And unfortunately, it is often associated with direct mortality of the animal. Hundreds of thousands of individuals are caught accidentally in fishing nets and fishing lines every single year. It is shocking the amount of bycatch that occurs, and it is even more surprising that there's animals still left to be caught. As such, bycatch is single-handedly considered the greatest threat to all marine predators. So to briefly touch on the conservation of the high seas, there's two popular management approaches to date. So firstly, you have marine protected areas. As you can see in this graph here, there is quite a few of them. And and some of them are in the open ocean, which I think it's pretty cool. And the second management approach that we have is gear restriction zones. So these are simply areas where you need to use different gears, like these circular hooks. But what they do is they stop the animal from swallowing the hook very deep. And so when you catch them accidentally, they have a less likelihood of mortality. However, both of these management approaches are largely static across space and time. And there's two big issues with this. Number one is that marine predators, as their threats, are highly mobile. So for example, in this graph here from a publication by Barbara Block and colleagues, that what they did is they tagged a bunch of different marine predators that you can see each color represents a different animal. But what's pretty evident there is that the movements are massive. They cross the whole ocean, no problem whatsoever. Second issue is that the oceans, contrary to land, is that while well, they're highly dynamic across space and time, so all of these fluxes and currents and oceanic processes drive a highly dynamic habitat with features that animals and research uses track changing over different spatial and temporal scales. So if we want to be if we want to be able to afford proper conservation to these animals, we need to understand where they go and why, as well as where they might interact with threats such as fisheries. So physical oceanography is a study dedicated to understanding the physical properties and dynamic processes of the ocean. Thanks to loads of research from people around the world, we now know that marine predators have some pretty strong association with physical ocean processes at different scales. So at the largest of scales, these animals tend to hang about areas of complex oceanography. So in this graph here from a publication by Derek Titensor, that they mapped the global distribution of marine predator diversity. Um, what you can say is pretty evident here is that diversity is pretty much concentrated around the Opolian region of West Africa, for example, or this current known as the Gulf Stream, or this seasonally stratifying tidally dominated shelf sea of the Patagonian shelf. At a finer scale, known as the mesoscale, which just means tens to hundreds of kilometers, all of these marine predators tend to associate with these convertible, these features that concentrate and enhance resources, 
for example. You can see a couple of them in this image from the Central California system. This is a sea surface temperature image. And for example, you can see this front, which fronts are strong convergences amongst water masses, but they don't mix, so you can see them clearly denoted by a straight line. And you also get these oceanic vortices, known as eddies, but they can be very productive in their core or in their peripheries. And in case anybody was wondering how a front looks like, I, well, that's a picture that I took a couple of weeks ago from a, from a plane in the Bay of Panama. And you can clearly see the front denoted by the white foam line. I'm pretty proud of it. And fortunately, I do not have any pictures of eddies. And those are a bit harder to catch. So to touch a bit on the fishery side of this, we now know that fisheries concentrate in areas of complex oceanography. So for example, in this map from Global Fishing Effort produced by Global Fishing Watch, which is a organization providing unparalleled, ac unparalleled access to human activities in the ocean. Um, so here you can see the fishing effort ranges from yellow lowest and blue strongest. You can see that, for example, fishing effort is pretty much concentrated around upwelling in West Africa, as we said earlier, or around the Gulf Stream, or around the Patagonian Shelf. So following on, now we have evidence that these also tend to associate with these features that I talked about earlier, like fronts and eddies. So now I'm going to talk a bit about a project that we carried out last year during my time at the University of Exeter. This was titled Bound to Meet on the drivers of spatiotemporal overlaps between high-use areas of a non-target predator and pelagic industrial fisheries. So with this project, we had one single objective, which was to understand what is the influence of physical ocean processes in structuring overlaps between oceanic predators and pelagic fisheries. So the region that we chose for, for this study was West Africa, which is clearly denoted by the black square. This is how it looks like when it's a bit zoomed in. And as I mentioned earlier, it is a seasonal upwelling system. So what happens is that this current here, denoted by the black line, uh, it strength, strengthens seasonally. And what, does, what that does is it drives quite a bit of cold water upwelling around the continental shelf. And this cold water upwelling results in very, very high productivity, as well as some very intense thermal front activity. It is a region with a very rich marine predator diversity. And as we saw earlier on this map, it is also one of the regions that experiences some of the highest fishing effort in the world. So the species that we focused in was a loggerhead sea turtle, Careta careta. This is a long-lived and highly threatened species. It is classified as critically endangered by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Unfortunately, it is commonly called as bycatch, mainly in pelagic longlines, which are these, these, these fishing vessels that deploy lines which measure like 100 kilometers, and there's hooks at every one meter interval, so loads of hooks. And what's pretty interesting here is that contrary to the life history mode accepted for many turtles, instead of foraging in the coast, what some loggerheads do is they actually stay in the open ocean and they forage around thermal fronts. So to give you a bit of a, bit of a brief story of what we did. So firstly, Brendan Godley and Lucy Hawks at the University of Exeter went ahead and they deployed no less than 30 satellite tags in nesting loggerheads in Boavista, Cape Verde. And in case you were wondering, that's where Boavista is, cleverly denoted by the yellow star. Then I went ahead and I downloaded seven years of longline fishing effort from Global Fishing Watch. Again, all of this data is open. Anybody can go ahead, ahead and access all of the data from Global Fishing Watch. And lastly, we chose five environmental predictors. In this case, we had sea surface temperature and chlorophyll A at the top. So chlorophyll A is an index of primary productivity in the ocean, and both sea surface temperature and chlorophyll A are commonly utilized as predictors of habitat suitability for loggerheads and other marine predators. Following on, we have sea level anomalies and eddy kinetic energy in the middle. These are both indicators of mesoscale eddy activity in the ocean. And then lastly, at the bottom, we have these frontal frequency maps that what they do is they denote areas of consistent frontal activity. And these are actually some pretty state-of-the-art science. 
They are developed by Peter Miller of Plymouth Marine Labs, which he was kind enough to share for the study. So thank you, Peter. So the first thing we did is we went ahead and we mapped the large field distribution of the movements. So here on the left, you can see the, the raw tracks of the loggerheads. And then we blocked them seasonally and mapped their distribution with a thing called a kernel utilization distribution. Now what it does is that it sort of shows you what is the overall home range. And as you reduce the, the percentage, percentage of the UD, you can start showing more the core areas utilized. In this case, blue is the overall home range. And from blue to red, it goes into the more core foraging areas. So you can see that the turtles tend to hang about mostly between Cape Verde and the continental shelf at all seasons. That seems to be their area. And then when we move on to the fisheries, it's quite shocking here, this graph on the left, how massive the movements are in comparison to the turtles. And when you look at the distribution seasonally, it does vary around a bit with, with the core foraging areas being principally located below Cape Verde. But what's pretty interesting, as the seasons pass from winter to spring to summer to autumn, the core foraging areas actually start developing in the continental shelf of West Africa, right where the turtles are hanging about. So then we went ahead and we mapped the spatial overlaps. This is more or less how it looks like. So the black contours are actually the home ranges from the UDs that I was talking about earlier. And the dashed lines are the exclusive economic zones of, of all of the nations surrounding there. And I forgot to put the names, but A is winter, B is spring, C is summer, and B is autumn, but that's a bit irrelevant at the moment. And then the cells that overlap are the ones actually seen in yellow and red. So yellow means least overlap intensity. This is mapped as a measure of the time spent by loggerheads in the cell, multiplied by the times of the long lines spent in the cell. So then we went ahead and we extracted all of the environmental information from the overlapping cells and the non-overlapping cells to model the probability of overlap according to the five environmental predictors that we have chosen. So here we utilize a bootstrapped generalized linear mixed effects model with a binomial distribution and this is more or less how the output looks like. So these are response curves of the model. And obviously the values at the bottom are not correct. These are standardized so we can compare amongst them. But here on the left, we have, or the y-axis, we have the probability of overlap. And on the x-axis, we have the predictor. In this case at the top, we see that sea surface temperature is negative, suggesting that the overlaps actually occur in really cool waters. A chlorophyll A, it suggests that the overlaps are actually occurring in very productive waters as the effect is linear and increasing. For sea level anomalies and eddy kinetic energy, the effect is actually negative, meaning that these, these, these overlaps don't really occur in areas of instant, intense eddy activity. However, if we look at the probability of overlap, you can see that the line increases positively very rapidly, meaning that these overlaps are occurring in areas of very intense frontal activity. So these are the effect sizes of the model. It's, it's a way to compare how strong is the influence of each predictor on the probability of overlap. So starting from the top, we have the effect of, oh, well, sorry, the dashed line represents a zero effect size, and then it can be either positive or negative. So we see that the effect of sea level anomalies is actually quite low, almost crosses zero, so it's insignificant. Eddy kinetic energy had a bigger negative effect, but still not, not so big. Sea surface temperature, again, as well negative, but a bit bigger. Chlorophyll A now has a positive effect, and it means and it's pretty big. And then when we move to the fronts, or the frontal frequency, we can see that the effect size for them is actually quite big, almost three times the size of chlorophyll A, which is the next strongest predictor. So this means that the overlaps are actually occurring in areas of very, very intense frontal activity. So then to understand if these overlaps occurred through passive means or was it an active mechanism that both the loggerheads and the long lines were going towards the fronts or the productive regions, we derived a habitat suitability model to see what is the influence of each of the predictors on explaining the absent distribution of these individuals. Uh, we did this utilizing a machine learning algorithm called booster regression trees that I'm not going to talk much about because then it gets a bit complex. But just so you see, this is more or less how the output looks like. 
and was pretty clear. This is the one for the loggerheads with the loggerhead clearly indicated at the bottom. So what's pretty interesting here is that you can see that frontal frequency is by far the most important predictor of the distribution of these animals. It is then followed by chlorophyll A and sea surface temperature, which with effect was also big, but not as big. And then lastly, you have eddy kinetic energy and sea level anomalies, but the effect is actually quite small. And anything below 10%, we usually say that is insignificant. So these two predictors are actually not very good. And what's pretty cool actually, is when you look at the, at the output for the long lines, we see something extremely similar. Frontal frequency, again, the most important predictor for the RADC distribution, followed by chlorophyll A and sea surface temperature, and lastly, um, with a very small effect, eddy kinetic energy and sea level anomalies. So what does those all mean? So basically, now we know that fronts are basically underpinning not only where the turtles want to go or where the long lines want to go, but it's also where they interact or where the spatial overlaps occur. So now, to touch a bit on the benefits that this offers to conservation. This goes mostly aligned with a field called dynamic ocean management, being pioneered by Sarah Maxwell and colleagues. And dynamic ocean management can be defined as a management that rapidly changes in space and time in response to changes in the ocean and its users through the integration of near real time biological, oceanographic, social, and or economic data. So what we can do here is map these fronts and we map the front, and then we can draw a protected area around the front. And as the move, as the front moves around, we can move the protected area on top of the front, or gear restriction zones, as well on the front. And this is actually not so new. This is a well-established management method. So there's this product called Pearl Watch, developed by the Hawaiian longline fishery to stop bycatch of loggerheads. And what they did is that they actually figured out that most of the negative interactions with between long lines and loggerheads occurred in the 15 degree isotherm, otherwise known as a frontal system. So what they do is that every day they map the sea surface temperature and they denote the 15 degree isotherm or frontal system. And they clearly denote it here by the, the brown encompassed area and they distribute all of these maps to the fishers around the place and they tell them and show them the areas where they're not supposed to fish and it's actually worked pretty well bycatch has been reduced pretty significantly and then another very cool product a bit more recent this is called ecocast it's developed again by noah sorry both of these products are developed by noah this one is developed by elliot hazen and heather welsh as well as another collaborator called Kylie Scales, who actually supervised the project that I am talking about right now. So what they do here is they build a habitat suitability model for all the non-target species, as well as the target species like tunas and swordfish. And what they do is they map every day the likelihood of encountering the, the non-target species and the target species as a way to highlight areas of danger, as well as potential areas for fishing. So evidently what I've just talked about makes it sound very simple, but actually there is quite a bit of work to be done. We're just uncovering the top of all of this and there's quite a few questions which we still need to answer. For example, how does this extend to male loggerheads, which we actually barely know anything about. All the turtles that we were using were females because they are the ones nesting. Uh, how does this extend to other loggerheads in the world or to other marine predators or to other marine predators in other regions and so on. There's, there's a very long list. This is just a very short summary. But well, um, just wanted to say thank you everyone for listening to me. I hope you've made it to the whole of my presentation. Um, in case you're interested, I have left a few references and I would like to give my acknowledgements to Kylie Scales, David March and Brenda Godley for giving me the chance to carry this project, Peter Miller for sharing the frontal maps and Rachel Graham, my current boss for getting me involved in this. And well, Thank you, everybody. And I've left my email down there in case anybody has any questions. Thank you.